The yeah. famous story, you know the famous story with the very came famous of it. The Malach and Reb Zusha, they were once uh, framed and they were put into jail. Reb Malach, Reb Malach was Zansk, and Reb Malach and Reb Zusha Yeah, you know, it's a famous story. You, if everyone knows the story, I don't have to say it. You know the story. I say, say more, maybe if you were in jail and dancing. Here. Yeah, okay, so, yeah, so what's the point of that story? One of them got, got upset. The other one says, why are you getting upset? He says, I can't dive him. Okay, maybe she doesn't want you to dive him. So if you're being disturbed to the point you can't learn, that means maybe she doesn't want you to learn. So how are you going to serve the Abish I don't know. You have to find another way to serve the Abish in whichever way you're able to. But what, what, what's it to be upset about? You're upset that you can't learn, but if the Abish if you really can't learn because of that, that means the Abish saying, I don't need to learn right now. Because otherwise, why would he do that? Ah, but what if it's he not? Why? Because he has free but will what, but, to be negligent. No, yes, he has free and will. He has free will. He has free will to be negligent, but that can't impact you unless David should decide you should be impacted. My free will can't impact you. Sure Your free will can't impact me. Uh, in the words of the Al Hanizik which means that when one person goes and hits another person, it's the person who hit the person, the person A, the hitter, is going to go to Gehenna. The person is going to be punished unless he does true. And asks for Michilla. But the person B has to know that he was going to get hit no matter what. And Harbor Shluchim Lamakim. And if that guy wouldn't have hit him, he would have walked down the street and a tree branch would have uh, fallen on his head and they would have gotten the same bump. It doesn't make a difference. Whatever happens to you is from the Abish term. It's none of your business about the other person. Your only business about the other person is to have obviously so and with a lot of love to, t- to try to, to do a Shech Shech But other than that, whatever happens to you. So you can't ask somebody to talk. And that's really the story with, uh, you know, there's another story. There's a chassid. I'm sure I said this story in the past. Ramandel Futterfas. He was once, uh, he was in Siberia. Have you heard of Ramandel Futterfas, right? You ever met, uh, what's your name? I forgot. What's his name? Shulam. You ever met him? You ever saw him? Met him? Okay. I had this chus when I was in Yeshiva in Kvar Chabad. He was the Mashpi over there. Um, he was a special person. And in 1946, 1946, there was an opportunity. The, the situation in Russia then was absolutely unbearable in terms of uh, the redifus, uh, the way the government was going after anyone who was teaching Torah, learning Torah, being a from Yid. Unless you were, you know, if you were old from Yid, you sat in your home and didn't bother anyone, they didn't care. But if you did anything, uh, any activism, you know, a shul, a mikveh, a cheder, yeah, teaching was the worst thing. That's, that was the biggest crime. Was to teach Torah, and um, the Chassidim realized they had to get out. They had to get out. In 1946, there was a huge escape from Russia. Hundreds of Chassidim escaped from Russia. Most of Lubavitch today, those that come from Russian Chassidim, Russian stock, left in 1946. Most, most so most of Lubavitchers. Again, today you have a lot of Lubavitchers that. Uh, our first or second generation Lubavitchers, but if you're a third generation Lubavitcher, chances are you're, you're, you're you know your, your father, your grandfather. My my father-in-law was on that was part of that escape, that, that big escape. And the reason why that became possible is because after the war, you know, the Russians they conquered half of uh, Poland during World War II. And then, and a lot of the citizens, a lot of the Polish citizens, they escaped. They fled deep into Russia, especially when the Nazis were coming and they were scared. So. After the war, the Russians gave permission for all Polish citizens to leave and go back to be repatriated, to repatriated and go back to the country. So they started a huge operation of creating fake Polish passports for Sydney, and they were able to go out. Hundreds of them were created, and it wasn't a small thing, and that, that, that it was a matter of not only creating all the fake passports, but it was also a matter of bribing the people who needed to be bribed, and it was a matter of... Uh, of getting um, uh, tickets on the trains to cost money was a huge operation. Um, all the chassidim then gathered in the city of, of, of Lvov, today known as Lviv. You know, in, uh, so today, as you know, Lviv is on, the, is on the border of Poland. Today, anyone who wants to go into Ukraine goes through Lviv. I, you know, my, 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 I told you, my, I have a brother-in-law and sister-in-law in Ukraine. So... <coughs> My sister-in-law and, and her children, when they left, they took a train from where the, their city, which is the Nefer Petrovsk, and they went to, to Lvov or Lviv. And from there they... they sorry? Where did they want to stay? I said they left, I just said. No, but the people that are there now, where did they want they to can't, stay there? First of all, men are not allowed to leave. Men of military age are not allowed to leave. That's number one. 
So there are a lot of my, my, my brother-in-law, for example. So he's the rub over there in Siddiqui Rebbe Petrovsk, and he has uh, hundreds of our trulas who can't leave. So he's staying there with them. He built he built a community. He's not he's not uh, he's not he's not going to run away. So my sister-in-law is here in America, but uh, my brother-in-law still there. He hasn't left. That's number one. And number two, it's very easy to say to run away. Imagine someone told you you have to run away from your house and uh, just take uh, pack a suitcase and leave. Run away, they're chasing people. They're, uh... but, it depends, but it depends where. It depends where in the country. Where, where my brother-in-law is, the Vila, it's, it's been it's been quiet. Depends where. But the bottom line is, so the reason why Lvov is right, Lvov is right on the on the border with Poland. So all of them sitting gathered in Lvov. Hundreds of them gathered in Lvov. There's a whole operation, and they made a bezin. Uh, everyone, the first thing, everyone had to give the bezin all their money and every every valuable they had, Actually, to pay for the operation. So this way, whether even the, if you're poor, you had no money, so it was financed by their, in other words, everyone pooled their money, and it was all given over to this Besden, and they used all the money to create all the passports and to buy the train tickets, and everything was done in a very uh, orderly way. And one of the people, there were three people in the, who were the big, big shots and the big people in this uh, operation. One of them was this Remedel Futterfass, and then there was another Chassid, who was passed away a few years ago, his name was Lebo Machkin, and then a third, it was a, it was a woman, I forgot her last name, the woman. But uh, Lubavitcher, Lubavitcher woman. Anyways, the bottom line is, so this Reb Mendel was very, was, again, he was one of the big people who literally saved hundreds of Sidon for getting them out of Russia at that time. It was Nisim. It was incredible Nisim, incredible miracles. You have to really realize they're, they're going through the, to the border. They're out, they have train loads of, of Sidon, and by the way, passports without even their real names, because they had to find the name of someone who, who was or who died, whatever. And the main thing is they didn't speak Polish. They're claiming to, they, they want to go back to Poland and be repatriated. But Baruch Hashem, it went, and it wasn't one. It was a few. It was a few. What they call in? Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if it's a Yiddish word or a Russian word. A echelon. Echelon is a train. A few. They had a few trains, and uh, when it came, one of the last trains, sort of Mendel decided, and he, he realized also that it's time that it's uh, that for him personally, it's extremely dangerous. Also. So he loaded his family onto the train and himself, and they got on the train. And before he got on the train, he met another chassid. His name was Rabbi Yoyna Khan. Rabbi Yoyna Khan. And when he told Rabbi Yoyna, when he told Rabbi Yoyna that he's leaving, and the reason why, because uh, Sir Rabbi Yoyna responded. He said, I guess there is a limit to Mr. Asnafash. Remandel heard those words. He sent off his wife and his kids, his son and his daughter, and he stayed behind. You know, by the way, even that, it's like the way he said, he didn't say, you can't, and then, how can you, how could you, whatever. Took it very matter of fact, I guess, I guess there's a limit to Mr. Asnatov. So he stayed, his wife and kids, uh, his wife and, and, and kids went off, and he was shortly thereafter, Remandel was arrested. And he did not see his family for close to 20 years. His family, meanwhile, went to England. There's a very famous story when he was, um, so you, you believe that there is a limit to Mr. Esnafesh? No, I believe, I believe that if they don't want you there, you should get out. He, he felt that there were more people who he could save and more people he can get out. He wanted, yes, he absolutely went on Mr. Esnafesh for Abbas Yisrael to, to try to get some more, to get, try to get some more chassidim out. That was his, that was his goal. Go to Eretz Yisrael. Sorry? Go to Eretz Yisrael, don't stay. He, again, he, he went back to help other Eden get out and go to Eretz Yisrael. It's called Mesir Asnafesh for Abbas Yisrael. Anyways, so where were we? Hmm. Anyway, this Rabbi Khan also eventually was arrested. This Rabbi Khan died in Siberia in a labor camp. He was in charge of the Chetimim in Russia. And there were, we know many, many, many Chesidim who, who were killed or who had died in the labor camps or spent many years in labor camps. There's actually a, an, an incredible story about Remendel when he was in prison, Remendel Futifas, that at one point he felt uh, couldn't couldn't anymore. So uh, he decided he needs to go into Yechidus by the river. He's in a labor camp in Siberia. So he got up and he walked to the edge, to the end of camp, to the up until where he can go because he's going to the river. He's going to go as far as he can. And when he got as far as he could, he stopped. And in his mind, I don't know if he, not a shidduch, he wants to write a letter to the, he needs to write a letter to the Rebbe, asking for a In his mind, 
he sat down in his mind and he wrote a letter to the Rebbe. I'm talking about this with the Friedrich the Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, asking for a bracha. And it was, as I said, he was in, camp, in the camps for many years, and then he was released, and there was, a, after he was released, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how long, eight years, ten years he was in the camps. And then when he was released, he was still, took him a while to be able to get out of Russia, and even then also, what was he doing? He was running around Russia, building the Kvois. That was after he was released from, from, from Siberia. But then he finally... Building the Kvois. Yeah. By the way, he be the Remendel, at, at a certain point, became very close to uh, the Rimnitzer Rebbe. I believe it was in Samarkand or Tashkent, where the Rimnitzer Rebbe was. And we know that, in, whatever... A Chabad Chassid isn't necessarily impressed by the fact that someone is called a Rebbe. That's, that's not, doesn't, it's not taken for granted. But uh, when, he, when he saw the Rimnitzer Rebbe on a daily basis going and breaking the ice and going to the mikveh, he was, uh, he was duly impressed. And they had a very, very strong friendship. Even later on, when he came to America, he visited the Rimnitzer But it's talking about mikvahs. Yeah, so even he was released from the labor camps and he was right away back to his uh, illegal activities. But finally, around 1965 or 1964, 1965, Remendel Geller gets out. And he finally gets to see his, um, his mishpacha, and they're in England. And when he comes, shortly later, his wife says, by the way, there's a letter here for you from the Friedrich Rebbe. Ah. Friedrich Rebbe, the letter. Friedrich Rebbe writes, I received your letter. This is shortly after he had written his letter from Friedrich Rebbe. A letter from Rebbe, I received your letter. Many years that was, that, was, that, was, that was probably 15 years before him. In other words, wow. by, by this time, the Peter of had passed away 15, year, um, 15 years earlier. No, it was dated. It was dated mm-hmm. right after he had written that letter in his mind to the Rebbe. He gets a letter. In response to your letter, a bracha, that you'll, you'll come up and everything will be fine. Everything wow. will be good. So, but the story that I'm, the, the, the story that I'm getting to is that in the, in the, in, in the, in the labor camps, so, you know, today you go to prison, so who's there? You do a low-life in the prisons, the criminals are in prison. But in Russia, it was an interesting mix. On the one hand, you had all the criminals there, Taka. On the other hand, you also you had the cream of society was there. Because if you had a half a brain and you used it, the Russians threw you into, threw you into prison. So if you were a doctor, a politician, a writer, anyone with an opinion, with it, because if you had an opinion and a brain, you're considered to be a threat to the revolution, because they wanted mindless, uh, mindless people to follow. So it was an interesting mix in the camps. And Remendel, obviously, he became close to it. He befriended more the, those people. It was like a, a chevra. And one, and one time, one day, one night, they're sitting together, this group. And one of the people turns to Remendel and says, Remendel, or whatever they call them, tell us, how is it that you're always so happy? And by the way, that was a signature of Remendel. Happiness by him was uh, always besimcha. Remendel passed away a year after Gimel Tamos, almost exactly, almost to the date. He passed away Dalit Tamos of 1995, a year after Gimel Tamos. And in that year afterwards, so he was, he was ill for some time, but also whenever, when he would fabrain, with the chsidim, and they would start uh, a song. We know that a lot of the Chassidah Shunugunim, we know, are slow and they're somber with uh, you know, heavy uh, emotions. And the man would say, sing a happy song. Erevil, he wants, the Yitzhahara wants that we should be sad. The Yitzhahara wants that we should be depressed. We're not going to let it. We're going to be happy. We're going to sing a happy nigga. That was... Uh, <clears throat> so... Yeah. So again, someone asked him, how are you so happy? So how does a youth answer a question? A youth always answers a question with a question. With a question. <laughs> so he turns back and says, why, why aren't you guys happy? Why aren't you happy? He's like, really? <laughs> you don't know why we're not happy here in Siberia in the labor camp? He says, yeah, what's, uh, why aren't you happy? No. So they went around the table. Or around the campfire, or whatever they were, wherever they were sitting, and one of them says, "I'm a doctor, and I spent 20, 20, you know, twelve years in school, and I'm busy uh, in the hospitals and doing surgeries, and and now I'm sitting over here, I can't do, I can't do anything." Another one says, "I'm an author, and I was in the middle of writing a book, 
And now the, the manuscript, uh, the, the unfinished manuscript is sitting in my apartment in Moscow. What's the, another one says, each one is going through, you know, how their life has been so interrupted and what they were trying to accomplish in life isn't happening because they are here in the Russian camp. And after they finish, Ramon says, oh, I get it. So all of you, you're sad because your plans in life aren't working out for you because you're here. That your goals, you're not able to chase your goals. My goal in life is to serve Hashem. And that I can do over here just like I can do in Moscow. It's a, it's, it's a spin on the... Mm-hmm. He was uh, in Chabad for a long time. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shmulik yeah, yeah. had a Shmulik. What? Shmulik Sorry? Shmulik Grunbo, the Gabba here. Yeah. Tell us a lot of stories in yeah. Chabad when he was young. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yeah, and this is a person, by the way, who one year he decided on Pesach because they'd get a little matzah shipped to him. He's like, and what's going to be with next year, Pesach? So a whole year he ran around with a little bag of matzah on him, an entire year, in case next year he doesn't get. We're talking wow. about, but I'll get to you in one second. Well, what's the what's the point? It's it's a, it's, it's like a modern takeoff of the story of the Malach and the which is, I need a certain Eibushter. Whatever happens to me, I need to serve the Eberster with that, because whatever happens to me, the Eberster does. So if I'm here in the Russian labor camp, the question is, how do I serve the Eberster here? If my goal in life is to serve Hashem, in which my life is not being interrupted, my, my life is about serving the Eberster. I could do that here also. So nothing ever interrupts you, Avoidah Hashem. Nothing ever interrupts It's not Shaykh. The question is, what is my Avoidah now? That's all. So if the, the phone goes off, the question is, what's your Avoidah? What, what are you getting frustrated about? If your job is to do a chayet chayet, which means with love and with a smile, to go into uh, and to, to do that, good, you're not frustrated, you're doing the, the Abishter one. That's why you're serving the Abishter. If the way you serve the Abishter is by going into the next room and, and, and learning, okay, but frustration doesn't begin. Where did frustration come from? I'll get to it in a second. What was your question? The Rittenster was a moyo, there's a famous story where the Mendel and the Rittenster went to do a risk together and they drove into the middle of the country someplace baby almost died, and so it's a whole story. It's that, ringing a bell. Yeah, it, you can, anyone can go to the website of the Center of Stock, and it has some stories on there, and it's an unbelievable story about uh, what happened, but they were very close to something. Yeah, and if I remember, I think it was the Lubavitcher kid, a lot of, I think a lot of the Lubavitcher kids who were born in Tashkent, their, their mail was their image. Could be, could be. And I, I know the, the register used to always fast a lot, Every day, they to, every day there was permissible. Right. And, uh, I don't know if the whole story with the KGB was following them and, and the river story, the way he would do the bris, he would, he would like, it was complete condition, but he would like rush and he wasn't like so uh, meticulous about it. And the baby started bleeding very much, almost dying. And like something happened, like where I think like he prayed very hard with Kavana and Eliel and he came and saved the baby and the baby was okay in the end. But it's a whole story. You can, yeah. Look it up on Google. The Rivnitzer was a Himmel de Kiyot. He was a uh, very holy Jew. Sorry? His cabbage in Muncie in the Sistine yeah. Cemetery. In yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, so where does frustration come from? Frustration comes from if my life isn't about serving the Eberster, if I have my own goals. And then my goals can be interrupted. So if I want to learn Tanya, not because it's serving the Eberster, because I enjoy learning Tanya, and because I want to finish up Eric, and someone's disturbing, then I get frustrated. We have to Ruben. Ruben. thanks Ruben, Ruben now because of him. Ruben? We'll see him. We'll see you. Ruben? We'll chat with him. We'll see you. Just want you to know everything I'm saying is with all the love in the world. I love you. Is that a Zayzman? What? It's a Zayzman. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Zayzman. If you're in a place where you can't learn, you can't talk, how are you? So if there's nothing, no other way to serve the Eibishter, then the way you serve the Eibishter is by not learning and by not talking. How do you serve the Eibishter when you're in the bathroom? If that, well, if that's what the Eibishter, the Eibishter, if then the, if the Eibishter right now wants me to sit and do nothing because I can't learn, I can't daven because they're they're schmutz and I'll pay Allah, I'm not allowed to. Then that's how I'm serving the Eibishter, and I do that with silha just like when I'm learning and davening. But how 
how are you serving him? You're just sitting there. You're just you, assisting. What do you mean? Why am I sitting here doing nothing? I want to learn. The Abish doesn't want me. So I'm being doing the Ratz and Alien right now, and I'm not, I'm not learning. That's a mitzvah. I'm doing the, the Ratz of Hashem. It's a different perspective, but absolutely. The question at any moment, the operative question is, what does the Abish want me to do right now? So usually, even if I can't dive and I can't learn, I can do something else. I can call up someone and give a, and give a, and give a, and give a good word and say something, make someone happy. But if you can't, then your avoida is to do nothing and say, hey, Abish, this is what you want, this is how I'm serving you. Can't do what? You can't. You can't call somebody up and okay. So them so a, okay. For a chizik, I mean, uh, that's, that's, Sheldon. That's also Sheldon, do you hear what I'm saying? If you have, if you have to sit in your chair in your seat and do nothing and say, "Abish, there, this is what you want me to do," and I'm doing it with simcha because you want me right now to do nothing, and that's simcha that you're serving the Abish. What is life about? Are you even allowed to do that to to, to express yourself to the Abish? You're, you're sitting in a place that's... I don't good. think there's any... I, I don't believe there's any... That's, that's, that's like uh, that's like davening itself to say something to so me. You don't, you don't say anything, but you know right now, Ayid always knows, I'm serving the Ebishter. And therefore, it's whatever it is, I'm happy about it. If, if it's about what what can I accomplish, what can I attain, okay, so right now I can't accomplish or attain anything. But if my life is just what does Hashem want to be right now, what does Hashem want me right now? At any moment, there's always what Hashem wants me. Sometimes it's to do something, sometimes it's not to do something. So, we haven't febrained in a long time. Uh-huh. Used to be we used to febrained in a special day. We, we stopped it. I guess the camera had to go off with a ring a little. <laughs> so, Thank you, Ruben. What? Thank you. We learned so many things. We're breaking the camera. Who broke the, the camera? Someone, someone wanted to have a so they broke the camera. <laughs> so, I'll tell you a story that happened with me, <coughs> with Remand, that, ha- that I was present by, with, uh, by, with your mental You were young. I was young, yes. This was when I was 18 years old. I'm still young. So, I was in, that year, I was in, I was in Krasha about this, is 1994. And it's actually, Mamash around this time, the Yeshua's. And I was doing that year in Krasha about. And on the second day of Yeshua's, towards evening, my older brother, who was also there in Kfar Chabad, I was at that time a Bachar in Yeshiva, he was a Shliach in the Yeshiva. He says, let's go. Let's go to our mental house and let's have rain with him. Because Yom Tiv is about to end. Now, you realize, when I'm saying the second day of Yom Tiv, in Israel, there is no second day of Yom Tiv. Mm-hmm. That is true. But Remendel kept two days of Yom Tiv. Always. Why did he keep two days of Yom Tiv? Because he argued that he didn't live in Israel. He lived in New York. He lived in Crown Heights. It just so happens that for the last 20 years or so, the Rebbe has him in his, you know, the post, the place where the Rebbe has him uh, staying temporarily is in Kfar Chabad, but he doesn't live there. He lives by the Rebbe. So therefore, he keeps two days Yom Tov because he lives in America. He's allowed to do that. I'm sure. I'm sure he checked it with the Rebbe. He used to be here also, but no. He used to come here, yeah, a few months a year he was here. A few months a year. Yeah, but it was, uh, so, so for him it was Yom Tif. So it's close to Shkia, it's close to uh, sundown. Me and my brother, we walk over, knock on the door, we go in. He was very happy that we came. And then someone else comes in, a chassid whose name was Reb Shlimke Madanchik. He was actually the mayor of Kfar Chabad for many years. He was uh, a very special Jew. He passed away, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. He was, uh, by profession, he was a train conductor. What? Yeah. A train, train conductor. conductor. And he worked in the, the train system in, um, in Israel. He was a, a Qatar, is that what it's called? Qatar, yeah. A Qatar. Very good. And he was, uh, you know, but that was his, uh, that wasn't, that was his, he, 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 he had the uniform, but he was an Askin, very big Askin. He was uh, very good friends with all the politicians, even until his last days, he was always, uh, and the, Re- the Rebbe had a lot of trust in him. 
different missions that we gave him. So he came in. So it was us. It was kind of sort of mental. My brother and myself and Reb Mendel's wife. And we sit down by the table and Reb Mendel, in his humility, instead of starting to talk, is usually what he would have. Does anyone have something to say? Does anyone have uh, a story, a thought, an idea? So my brother said, yeah, a story. I heard recently. What was the story? So there was a chassid whose name was Reb Zalman Moisha Yitzchaki. Actually, that's far the chassid. And he was one of the Yitzchaki. And he was um, one of the distinguished chassidim of the previous rabbi. At the same time, he was known for his harshness. He was an Isha Gvura. But when I say he was a harsh person, a, a real Isha Gvura, a holy Isha Gvura, is harsher on themselves than they are on others. It's not that they're, uh, you know, easy on themselves and hard, you know, what does the Gemara talk about? Uh, I think in, in Saita, who's a, one, of, one of the definitions of, of, of a Rasha Arum, of a shrewd Rasha, someone who is makeable for himself, a Machmer for other people. He was Ishak Vura, he had high expectations of himself, high expectations of others. He didn't put up with, uh, with, with garbage, with mediocrity. But he was high, a highly respected chassid. There was once a Fabrengen, this is the story my brother sang. By the way, this, um, this Reb Zalman Moshe was her Mendel for the Fasas Mashpia. They say that when Mendel, when he left Russia, the most emotional place that he went, that he was at was when he, when he came to the cave where Reb Zalman Moshe. Say that he cried buckets of tears over there. Okay. This is Reb Zalman Moshe. Reb Zalman Moshe is coming. I don't know if you know in Crown Heights. There's a there's a mishpacha. Do you listen to mishpacha? Have you ever heard of it? A, well, a wealthy family. Okay. What? Well, I come see you all the time. So the reason the, the, the right. So this is his grandfather. This is his great grandfather. This great grand his father, his great grandfather. Yeah. In other words, his grandfather was a very esteemed mashpia whose name was Rabbi Ram Mayar, Rabbi Ram Drizin, and Rabbi Zalman Moshe was Rabbi Ram Mayar's father-in-law. So this is his great grandfather. Yeah. Passed away, I think, in 1953. So this story is in the 1920s. And the, pre- the previous Rebbe is Fabrengen in Leningrad. And the way it works by Fabrengen, maybe some of you have been by Fabrengen as a Rebbe before, there's a head table, right? And then there's Ksidim sitting in front. And then there's like a wall of people on all sides, like, like bleachers going up, right? A wall of people. And this was Alam by virtue of his... Uh, he was a, a venerated elderly chassid. He could have been at the head table. He never was at the head table. He was always not even sitting in front, not even in the wall, the wall of people. He would stand outside the wall and stick his ear in to be able to hear what the Rebbe is saying. It's a sign of... Uh, I never. Yeah. It happened once during a Fabrengen <clears throat> that the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, called him over, summoned him. So he came to the Rebbe. The Rebbe told him something, spoke to him. And when he went back to his place, he was mobbed by the chassidim. The chassidim wanted to know, what did the Rebbe tell you? He says, I, he says, I don't know. <laughs> he said, what do you mean you don't know? The Rebbe just spoke to you. He says, yeah. But the entire time that the Rebbe was speaking to me, there was only one thought that was going through my head. When will the Rebbe... Then with the Rebbe Shaina, Rapnam is an Helika Ayin from the Khazar Shapana. When will the Rebbe already remove his, his holy eyes from my piggish face? And that thought was so consuming him that he didn't hear what the Rebbe told him. Wow. <laughs> what was no space? This is not, I, I, again, this is not a usual chassid. This is not a re, and I wouldn't say this is a regular Seder Havoid, a regular way, but this was he was extremely um, and with with, with, with with the whole MS, but him it was with the whole MS, which is it's understandable why he was a respected person when someone is like that in the end with the MS. 
What's, by some people, they do it's games, you know. By him, it wasn't games. Anyways. Okay, but that's not uh, that's not how the story goes. <laughs> it's not how the story goes. That's a possibly it's another interpretation of the story. But the simple interpretation is that he says, Pasha, I didn't hear what the Rebbe told me." Anyways, so that was the story that my brother said. So I listened, gave my brother Yashukaya, and then it was quiet for a few moments. As you know, uh, a, a, a pause in the action. And after a phase, I don't know, a minute of quiet or so, so Reb Shlemkin Madanshik turns to the mental and says to him, You said, Don't give in. Nay? You were there by that Rebbe? No? no? Yeah. So Shlemkin says, And the story as this <coughs> Bacher said it isn't exactly correct. He made some mistakes in the way he said over the story. And Mendel says, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so Rav Shlemke says, do so, what talk happened? What was the story? <laughs> so he said over the story, he created, now this is the story, the way I'm saying, I don't remember the mistakes my brother made, but the story, the way I'm saying it is, the way, I know it was 30 years ago, but the way I believe I recall him, uh, him saying it at the time with the corrections. Now, I, I was a young bacher at the time, but I just remembered, I was blown away by that. The Avas Yisrael, he heard the story, in blink eyes. You know, most people, when you start saying a story, well, stop. I was there. You know, I was there. You know, you're saying the story, I was there. And then, even if you can hold yourself back and you don't scream right away, I was there, but if the person starts messing up the story and saying it wrong, you jump. that's when you stomp on that person, you jump on that person. How dare you, right? <laughs> that's not the way it happened. I was there. You young schnook. <laughs> He listened to the story as if it was the first time he heard the story. He was there. He listened to it as the first time. He said, thank you. We're ready to move on. Wow. He had no need whatsoever to inject himself in the conversation. It's not about him. It's a bacher saying a story. A bacher who needs to be uh, built. You know, a bacher who needs to be uh, Lift up. lifted up. A bacher who needs to be encouraged to speak and to say a story. And it, to him, it was, it, was, it was of utter irrelevance, even to correct him, which is an amazing lesson. Sometimes wow. we think, right, Ruben, we have a person says something wrong, you have to correct him. No, you don't have to correct him. It's not, not, not always an issue to correct. Sometimes let, her, let the person speak. You don't have to say anything. And, you know, a lot of times when you hear about, obviously, Saul, you hear amazing stories. You know, this person donated a kidney. And this person uh, gave up their, you know... Uh, you know, even Remendel himself, you know, you have saved hundreds of Yidin. The biggest, obviously, soul stories aren't the flashy ones. The biggest, obviously, soul stories are the ones that happen in the course of everyday life, which no one knows about. Like, had this, had this Madanchik not been there, you realize, I would not, we would never, no one would have known that there was anything special happening either. You know, it's not like you get in the newspapers for, for donating a kidney. A real, obviously, soul is not in a special moment when you're called upon to do something uh, huge and large, the real obvious Yisrael is in a daily interaction, interacting with another Yid, taking the other Yid, the, their feelings into consideration, not saying something that Chas Hashem can hurt another Yid, making sure that whatever you say to the other Yid is building up another Yid. And that was an incredible lesson I learned from Remendel in terms of obvious Yisrael. We're good? I guess so. You still have another 15 minutes left. So let's talk about thank what you. we uh, think. Let's talk about uh, what I... Th- with the camera malfunction, what I thought to speak about something which is connected to this week's Parsha. Connected to this week's Parsha, connected to Tanya, not, not to the Tanya that we're learning right now, but to the to Tanya which we're doing the Kuti Amarim. You know the Gemara tells us, no, Rapsasan, Ein Adam Ebra Vera, Ella Imkain, Nichnas Boy, Ruach Stus. Right. Well, he doesn't have Vera. 
It's insanity. Which is an amazing Hagdara. It's an amazing definition. Because you're going to say, we don't say that a person does an Aveda, when you do something in Aveda, they're evil. What they're doing, they're being rebellious against Hashem. Where's the matter? If you do an Aveda, you're insane. Why is it insane to do an Aveda? What's the definition of insanity? So the way, excuse me, the way it's explained in Tanya and Why is it insane? Because if you took a moment for a second and thought about it, you'd realize that your greatest and most important desire and goal and aspiration in life is to connect to Hashem. And the thing that you fear more than anything else is being cut off from Hashem. What's the proof? Usually you go over to a person and say, what do you fear more than anything else? What is the average person going to say? Well, maybe some people will say speaking in public. But really, what's the biggest fear that a person has? Is dying. But for a yid, the fear of being cut off from Hashem is greater than the fear of dying. And what's the proof to that? The proof is that historically, yidin in mass, hundreds of thousands and millions have given up their lives rather than rather than um, convert out of Yiddishkeit, rather than um, reject their Yiddishkeit. Which means that even worse than dying is being caught up from Hashem. So you realize that the, Yid, the most incredible fear that a Yid has is being caught up from Hashem. And what does a Yid desire more than anything else? is to be connected to Hashem. When you do an Aveda, what are you doing? You're cutting yourself off from Hashem. That's insane. That's insane because that's not consistent with what you want. That's not what you want. You want to be connected to Hashem. You don't want to be disconnected from Hashem. And therefore, to do an Aveda is insane. It's not evil. It's just you're working. It's self-sabotage. When the Gemara says that to do an Aveda is a Ruach Shtos, is an insanity. So what's the Raya? The Raya is from this week's Parsha. This week's Parsha says, Ish, Ish, Ki Sista Ish, right? The word Sista is, right, is, uh, so at least in the, is related to the word Shtos. One is a Sin, and one is a Shin, but related. So from here we see that if some that, uh, so it can be right, Ki Sista, the, the Pashib Shat, Ish, Ish, Ki Sista Ish, they means that if a person's wife, Sista, she veers off, veers off the path of, of Tznias. But it can be read also, ish, 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 kisishte ish, a person whose wife uh, does something insane. So from here we see that every, that an affair is a ruach tos. So the Rebbe, in the the Rebbe asks us a simple question. Chazal are asserting that every single affair is a ruach tos. It's insane to do every affair. If that's the case, and if the Torah wants to tell us that an affair is, every affair is insanity, so by what sort of Avera should the Torah write the word Shtus? By a very severe Avera? Or by Avera which is, uh, you might want to say, from the Kalois, uh, easy. an easy Avera. Not that there's such a thing as easy Avera, but uh, what would you say? Yeah. It should tell you why. And then you make a Kavu If it would be a small Avera, Again, everything relative. Those things are small aveda, but relative. That you could say, if that small aveda is insanity, Allah has come of a kama, how much more so the big avedas. But no, what does the Torah do? The Torah makes that statement by a case of, of, of Neuf, adultery. Adultery is one of the Aseris Adibis. Adultery is one of the avedas that you harig, harig val yaver, right? So the Kalchemer doesn't really work. Maybe only a big aveda is, uh, is an insanity. So the Rebbe doesn't really answer the question. But the, but the, make, the, the Rebbe says there has to be a reason why the Torah would say it, Dafka, by this case of, of Eishasish, this case of adultery, 
because there's something instructive. There's a reason why the Torah chooses, but even though it would seem logically the Torah should put it by a Latra Veda, there's a reason why the Torah chooses specifically to do it, uh, to put it by adultery. What is that reason? Because adultery is the reason why it's a Roshtos. The understanding that every single time a Yid does an Avera, it's adultery. That's why it's a Roshtos. Why is because we're married. We're married to Hashem. All Shir Shirim is right. Hashem is the husband. And we are the wife. And we're married. If we're to understand that every single Aveda is ish ish kisiste ishtoi, is pashat, then we would and that's why the in other for Aveda Elim Ken Yikmas Bay Roshtus is Nafka over here. And the idea of marriage is a very instructive example. Why is that? In marriage also, there's what we call kalos and chamuris, meaning in marriage, a spouse can be guilty of a small infraction, and a, gal- a spouse can be guilty of a large infraction. A small infraction is, you know, you come home uh, from work and uh, you're in a bad mood and you scream at your, or you're nasty, or you, uh, you don't have to scream necessarily. There's, uh, there's more classy ways of being rude without screaming, right? Uh, Being passive-aggressive or uh, sarcastic or whatever it may be. A small infraction can be your wife wants you, uh, you know, put on the toilet seat when you finish. I don't do it. Whatever, right? Throw your socks in the hamper, not on the floor. Small infractions. Not being there for your spouse when he or she needs you. Now, they're big infractions. Big infractions in terms of uh, being abusive, bigger infractions in terms of real uh, cases of insensitivity, and then obviously there's the biggest infraction, which is actual infidelity, is being unfaithful. What is the common denominator between every infraction, whether it's a big one or whether it's a small one? Common denominator is that at the moment when you did that, you consciously made a choice to step out of the marriage. Because in marriage, you don't do that. In marriage, you don't treat your husband that way. In marriage, you don't treat your wife that way. So at this moment, you said, it was a statement, I am not, right now, I'm not married. Now, you can have one infraction that's more severe, one less, but in terms of that essential statement that you're making, which is, at this moment, I'm not connected with you, I'm not united with you, because if I was connected and united with you, I wouldn't be doing this. I'm separate from you. We're not one. We're not a we. We're two separate things. There's no difference. Why is it real? Sorry? As a country, you still Why don't you call that a real? What's that? What's that? Getting there. People do things inadvertently. They don't, they don't mean to do it. And, and, these, and the spouse is insulted or, you know, they feel rejected. But the person had no intention of doing anything like that. So we're, we're, at, at the moment, we're talking about intentional. We're not talking about unintentional. Would you, however, say there's no difference between a small infraction and a big infraction because they're all the same? You wouldn't say that. No. no but not. what's the difference? The difference is not so much in the moment of the infraction, because at the moment of the infraction, any infraction is a separation. And a complete separation, a complete divide. The difference is in terms of the after effects. The what? The after effects. The after effects. How long does it take? To recover from this. Can I recover from this? There's sometimes that the infraction is so large, that's it. It's broken forever. Sometimes it's a large one, but not. it takes a long time to, re, to, to remove the stain and to, and to atone and to correct. If it's a very small thing, you move on right away. The same thing is when it comes to Averis. This is what Dr. Ebb explains it in Tanya, in Perich of Days, in Perich of Dawit. Every time a Yid does an Avera, Absolutely, it's a statement. I'm removing myself from Hashem. And there's no difference between a big Aveda, a small Aveda, a Aveda. But are there differences in Avedas? Yeah. Some Avedas, they're so large, but it's in the after effect. So some Avedas are Karas. That's it. You're cut off. Some Avedas, the after effects are less. That's why also why different Avedas have different types of punishment, different types of Gehenna. 
Because we know it's not a pot, it's about it's cleaning off. How long does it take to clean it off? How long does it take? But in terms of the actual, at the moment of the Avera, when a person does an Avera, they're absolutely disconnected from Hashem. It doesn't make a difference which Avera. The question is only how long are the after effects going to last. So in that way, it's an analog to marriage. It's mamish, the same liquid. We're married to the Avish. And anytime we do an Avera, we're stepping out of our marriage. Now the question is, can our marriage survive that? That depends on the Avera. Some yeah, some no. Some easier, some less. But ultimately, why is it a shtus to do an Avera? Because as Yidin, we never, even for a moment, want to step out of our marriage 